Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. It's a marvelous and amazing thought that Christ came into the world to save sinners. And as Paul himself said, of whom I am chief. Each one of us who knows the Lord Jesus Christ knows what a tremendous debt of gratitude we have to him. Without Christ, we have nothing but the judgment of God. And he is the one who is our shepherd. We've been looking at the names of God now over 24 weeks. The names of God are inexhaustible. We read that passage in Exodus chapter 3 this morning, which we have read each Sunday as we have looked at the name and the names of God. And God defines himself by his names. He tells us his character. He tells us his power. He tells us of not only his ability, but he tells us of his mercy and his love. He tells us that he is our savior. He tells us that he is the eternally existing one. And the name at which we have been looking most recently is the Lord is my shepherd. He is the shepherd of the flock. The Old Testament calls him the shepherd of Israel. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And he reminds us that the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That's an incredible picture of the love that God had for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No, we don't deserve it. But God manifested his love toward us in that way. The portion of Psalm 23 where God describes himself as the shepherd is in verse 5, which we reached last time. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. We have learned so far that the anointing that God does by his Holy Spirit for those who have placed their faith in Christ is an anointing for separated service, an anointing for consecration. And we saw last time we were together that 1 John chapter 2 tells us seven things that that anointing enables us to do. It enables us to obey the commands of Christ. You cannot obey the commands of Christ without the anointing work of the Spirit of God. That's 1 John 2 verses 3 through 6. The second thing that we learned was that the anointing by the Spirit of God enables us to have a genuine, visible love for other Christians. Not just a superficial love, not just a smiley face, not the kind of love that the world has, but a genuine love for other Christians. That is enabled by the Spirit of God. That's verses 7 through 11. The third thing, which is so very important, is that the anointing of the Holy Spirit clears our conscience from sin. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that forgives our sins, that washes our sins away, but we have this memory there in the back of our minds of sins that we committed in the past, and the devil likes to take hold of that and use it against us. But the anointing of the Spirit of God, as it combines with the blood of Christ, cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The fourth thing we saw that the anointing of the Spirit does, it enables us to engage in spiritual warfare. The scripture talks about your adversary, the devil, who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished on your brethren, which are in the world. We've been given spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6, and it's listed for us there. But what enables us to use that is the anointing work of the Spirit of God. 
That's 1 John 2, verses 13 and 14. The anointing of the Spirit of God enables us to understand doctrinal truth. Verse 14. You know, as you look at the world around you, there are many people who are involved in cultic movements. Some of them even use the Bible. But they do not understand what the Scripture is declaring. They take it, they twist it, they pervert it, they omit things, they add things to it, but they do not understand it. Paul explains that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 at the end of the chapter and the first few verses of chapter 3 where he discusses the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. And he tells us that for the natural man, the things of the Spirit of God are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. He can read the words in English or whatever his language happens to be, but he cannot truly understand what God is telling us if he has not first trusted Christ and at that moment received this incredible blessing of the indwelling Holy Spirit who anoints us to understand the word of God. The sixth thing that we saw was that the anointing of the Spirit enables us to discern who our enemies are. That's verses 15 through 19. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those verses tell us, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And then the final thing that the anointing enables us to do is it enables us to distinguish lies from truth. Have you ever been deceived? Have you ever been tricked? <laughs> I think all of us have at one time or another. We've probably actually thrilled at some of that as we saw some sleight of hand artists get up there and make a rubber ball disappear and then suddenly make three rubber balls appear in that hand and pull a, a rabbit out of a hat or whatever else he had happened to do. But we've been deceived on more serious levels than that too. The anointing of the Spirit of God enables us to distinguish lies from truth. And so, a summary then of what we've learned from that phrase, Thou anointest my head with oil. That high anointed calling of God given to every believer is for consecration, for sanctification, and for service until Jesus comes again. Secondly, the anointing of the Spirit of God is absolutely essential to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That anointing gives us the desire to look for the coming of Christ and thus motivates us to holy living and fervent service. And finally, what we learned was being anointed by the Spirit enables him to teach us what to believe and how to live while we look for Christ's return. But the anointing of him which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That's not just head theology. Abiding in Christ is a matter of practical Christian living, the way that we live in this world. And that gives us a very important responsibility of representing Christ to the world around us. We are the vessels that are designed to visibly show that we have been cleansed for use by our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes to young Timothy, and young men have different drives in their lives, and some of them sometimes get out of control. And so Paul writes to Timothy and says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, all these sinful things that Paul has been discussing with young Timothy, his protege, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. A vessel carries something. Some vessels carry things that are very valuable and very precious. 
And it tells us he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet, that is, fitting, for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. We also learned a few things about that cup, my cup runneth over. We saw that God does not give us a stingy portion in our cup, but his water flows from inside until it overflows the brim. Jesus spoke of this when he spoke of the rivers of living water that would bubble up in the cup of and from the cup of those who believe on him and receive the Spirit of God. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. It was a promise that our Lord Jesus Christ made concerning those who trust in Christ and then receive the Spirit of God, that that well of water that flows up in them would not only be sufficient for them, but that they would also express this great gift and truth to others around them. We saw that this occurred, this speech of our Lord at the Feast of Tabernacle, reminded the Jews of the ingathering of the harvest at the blessing of God. He reminded them of the protection and blessing he gave them as they journeyed through the wilderness. He reminded them that they had been delivered from the house of bondage into the glorious freedom of God. And God led them through the wilderness, just like a shepherd leads his sheep through the wilderness, providing their daily food, morning, every morning, one morning after another, day after day, for 40 years he provided them day by day. And Jesus reminds us that when we pray, we should say, give us this day our daily bread. The things, the resources that God gave to Israel, they were not able to hoard those things. They rotted and stank if they tried to keep it overnight. The resources that God gives to us, how often we try to hoard them instead of using them as God has intended. The rock that followed them was Christ himself, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. Jesus promised the woman at the well in Samaria that there would be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life if she would trust in him. My cup runneth over. You see, in claiming to be the fountain of living waters, Jesus was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be Jehovah in fulfillment of the prophecies in Zechariah chapter 13. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And that is followed up by Revelation 21, the last book of the Bible in verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. And this is Jesus speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Jesus seen in the Old Testament, Jesus seen in the New Testament, Jesus proclaiming himself through the many things he said throughout his earthly ministry, that he was the God of Israel who had come to save his people, who had come in human flesh that he might bear our sins on Calvary. And over and over again he fulfilled those promises of the word of God. That's what happens to us when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, as the psalmist says, my cup runneth over. That's what happens when we drink the cup of salvation, when we come to Christ and call upon him, the one who is the Lord, because his cup is infinitely large in its provision. That's where we ended last week. But we have to say just one more thing about that cup. We probably have a picture in our mind of a cup that we hold in our hand to drink. But think for a moment in terms of the 23rd Psalm, which we've been reading, where this picture is given to us. Think for a moment in terms of the sheep who are grazing by still waters. That is the context of my cup runneth over. The source of the water is not a running river that could sweep the sheep away. The source of the water is not a stagnant pool with pond scum on it. 
The source of the water is not an evaporating, shrinking body of water that was left by the last rain, but that soon will soak into the ground. The source of the water, and this is what Jesus speaks of himself, is an underground spring at the bottom of the pool that keeps replenishing the pond with fresh, cool water over and over and over again, no matter how many sheep drink out of it, no matter how much of it evaporates or is used for other purposes, the water keeps filling the pool to the brim until it runs over. You know, there are many different cups in Scripture, including the cup of God's judgment, the cup of his wrath, the cup of consolation, a cup of trembling, the cup of suffering. Babylon is called a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, and so on. I'll give you only one example of this type of use of cup in Scripture. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and in horrible tempest this shall be the portion of their cup. But there is one other picture of the cup in Scripture that applies to our text in Psalm 23. And it fits very well within that context. The people of God are pictured as a cup, a vessel that holds something precious and life-giving. David tells us in Psalm 16, 5, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. Did you get that? God himself is the portion that is in our cup the indwelling Holy Spirit, as Paul explains in the New Testament. We are vessels that God will use. You remember when Saul was converted and later became Paul, but on the road to Damascus, and he was struck blind by the light, and then he was led by the hand into a house in Damascus, and the Lord appeared to Ananias and said, Ananias, I want you to go, and I want you to talk to this guy by the name of Saul, and Ananias responded, Lord, I really don't want that job. Give it to somebody else. Because I've heard about that fella. I mean, he's really bad news. He's persecuting Christians all over the place. He's grabbing them and dragging them to jail, men and women. He's killing some of us. You know, here my Lord, send him. <laughs> no. God said this. Listen carefully. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He's a cup. He's carrying something. And it's something that's very valuable. He's a chosen vessel. That means God looked at the list of vessels that he had and he said, I think the one that I want for this particular purpose is this vessel here. He's a chosen vessel. And he reached up and picked Saul. He's a chosen vessel unto me. And what is he going to bear? What's going to be in this vessel to bear my name? What have we been talking about? For 24 weeks, what have we been talking about? The names of God. He is a chosen vessel to bear my name. Did you know that you are also a chosen vessel to bear the name of Christ? If you're saved... You are a chosen vessel. But if you are saved, you are a chosen vessel for a purpose. You are a chosen vessel that bears the name of Christ. When people see you, do they see him? When people hear you, do they hear him? When the name of Jesus comes to your lips, is it a blessing or is it, as we hear frequently around us, a curse? 
He is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You remember as we looked at the opening verses of the book of Acts, here we are nine chapters into the book of Acts, that verse I just read to you. But at the beginning of the book of Acts, in verses 8 through 11, Jesus tells them, You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God is reminding Ananias as he tells him about Saul that this is what Saul is also going to be doing. This one who was a persecutor of Christians. This one who killed them and threw them into prison. This one who bore witness against them. He is a chosen vessel to bear my name. It doesn't matter what your past is like. It doesn't matter how bad you were. It doesn't matter what horrible things you've done or even how anti-Christ you were in your past. If you're saved, you're a chosen vessel to bear his name. What an incredible privilege. Those vessels, there are different kinds of vessels. Paul explains it in Romans 9.21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Some of you have seen perhaps at uh, county fairs and so on a potter who is sitting there and spinning his wheel with his foot and then there's this little disc on top and he plops a lump of clay and then he skillfully begins to move his fingers on that clay until the vessel begins to take shape and then he sticks his thumb on the edge and sticks fingers down inside as he hollows it out until it becomes a vessel that is shaped the way in which he wants it to be shaped. The clay merely must be malleable. He doesn't take a lump of dirt. He takes clay. It's clay that's been moistened. It's clay that has been prepared specifically for making the vessel that the potter determines. And Paul uses that illustration here of us as people of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Now you can understand this. You have vessels in your kitchen for honor, such as the fine china used only to entertain your special guests. But you also have vessels unto dishonor, like your kitchen garbage can. You know, both of those vessels fulfill the purpose for which they are made. Even as the elect and the reprobate fulfill the purposes for which God made them. But what are we supposed to do with our vessel once God makes it into a vessel for honor? The Bible explains in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor in sanctification and honor. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That ties us back to the phrase dealing with anointing. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup or my vessel runneth over. We were anointed, one of the chief purposes being for sanctification. And now we are to possess our vessel, our cup, in sanctification and honor. My cup runneth over. What does our cup contain? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we need to keep that temple pure and clean. How important is that? Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. You're not God, but you're his temple. You're not like some kind of a new age philosophy where we all sort of float out there and become gods. You're not like the Mormons who think that oh, they're on their way to becoming gods. But you are a temple. A temple where God lives. 
Ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That's what the Bible says. How often we treat these temples that God has made for his spirit to reside in, how often we treat them with disdain and with unholiness. Verse 17, what happens to those who defile the temple of the Holy Spirit? The very next verse tells us, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. This building is not a temple. This is a building in which the church meets. The church is the body of Christ, the believers. The church can meet in a cave. The church can meet as they did in the catacombs. The church can meet in the jungles or in the frozen wastelands of the north as many believers in Russia had to do under the worst periods of communism. The church can meet in secret house churches as it does today in China. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. How then should we treat the bodies that God has given to us? That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Three chapters later, the Apostle Paul says it again. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And he goes on to explain, for you are bought with the price. You see, you don't own yourself. There's a big movement today that you know, pushes for abortion because they say, well, it's my body. No, if you're a Christian, it's not your body. If you're a Christian, you were bought with a price. And that price was the precious blood of Christ. An infinitely valuable price which makes you valuable in the sight of God because of the price that he paid for you. And then he placed his Holy Spirit inside of you. And you became the temple of his choice. No longer a stone temple in Jerusalem, but God has chosen you as a Christian to be the place of his residence. Oh, how should we then glorify him? He's a chosen vessel to bear my name because he lives there. The Spirit of God inside us. It's incredible to see what the scripture has to say on this. Not only our physical houses belong to God as a stewardship, but so does our body, which is the house of the Holy Spirit ever since the day of Pentecost. You are the cup. You are the vessel. You are the temple that houses the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How far should we then flee from idols? Oh, not merely those things we see with our eyes, though that is certainly included. But the idols of American life are money, our jobs and security, our bank account, our position, our esteem in the eyes of our friends, our freedom. You know, there are many other things that can become your God and that can take your focus off of Jesus Christ. Whenever you put something else besides Jesus Christ on the throne of your life, you have an idol. 
And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell, that is, live, in them and walk in them. In other words, <laughs> you know, in the morning, you leave your house and go somewhere. Your house doesn't walk around with you, but God says, I will walk in them. Can you imagine if walking every place you carried your house, sort of like a, a snail or a nautilus or some kind of a, one of those little housed sea creatures? They carry their houses with them. <laughs> I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. You never get away from him. There's no place that you can go that God doesn't see you. The scripture says, Thou, Lord, seest me. David says, If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to hell, you're there. If I go into the midst of the sea, you're there. If I run as far as the east is from the west, you're there. If I run into the uttermost parts of the morning, you're there. You can't escape him. He is everywhere. He is what's called, theologically, omnipresent. But with God's people, he has a very special relationship. I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them. Does it give you a little more insight into that phrase in the Psalms, my cup runneth over? When Jesus says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he said this to them because the Holy Spirit was yet to come. He was speaking of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of Christians. Fantastic truth. Paul uses that same illustration, the illustration of a building, not only of individual believers, but he uses it also of corporate groups of believers. Those groups of believers that meet together for a local fellowship, what we would call a church. He explains that over in Ephesians chapter 2. So now think about it, this building for just a second. It has many different component parts. Some of you actually saw it as it was going up. Perhaps some of you were involved in its architecture and design. Some of you were involved in overseeing some of the workmen that were here in this church. But think about its component parts for just a second. To build the church, you wouldn't want to use rotten boards, crumbling bricks, rusty nails, and defective cement. Now, God talks about each one of us as a building block in his church, not the visible building, but the church as the group of believers. Listen to what he says. If you're a building block in the house of God that God is constructing, your job is to be the best component possible. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. Speaking to the believers at Ephesus says, And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom, that is, in Christ, all the building fitly framed together, in other words, every piece fits where it's supposed to fit, fitly framed together unto an holy temple in the Lord. He's not building a stone building here. He's building with people. It's a growing building. It's growing unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation. A habitation is a place that you inhabit. <laughs> a habitation is the place you live. You are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. That's how God views you if you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit lives in you individually, but God doesn't want us to be a bunch of mavericks out there doing our own thing. God is taking believers in whom the Spirit of God lives and he is building us together into a holy temple so that the world might know that we belong to Christ, a habitation of God through the Spirit. My cup runneth over. 
keeping the temple of our bodies morally pure and clean is a responsibility that God has placed squarely on each one of us. God uses clean vessels. If you want to be used by God, now you can be saved and be a dirty vessel. But if you want to be used by God, that is an absolute requirement. Remember that verse in 2 Timothy 2? If a man therefore purge himself, that is clean himself up from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. God uses clean vessels. Keep yourself pure. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Here's a beautiful picture of a vessel, of a cup. Oh, this is a beautiful china cup here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. He's been talking to the wives and telling them how they should live. And now he talks to the husbands. And he says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that is, with your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. The weaker cup. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. See, when a man and woman join together in marriage, they become one flesh. And they are seen as one in the sight of God. They are two distinct persons, but God sees that invisible bond that has taken place. And they are heirs together. They are joint heirs. They have special blessing from God as heirs together of what? The grace of life. I think that's also a reference to the production of children, the grace of life. But look at that last phrase also. That your prayers be not hindered. Husbands who don't treat their wives properly will discover that their prayers are hindered. Your wife is like fine china. She is the weaker vessel. Your wife is not like the garbage can in the kitchen. Treat her with holy dignity. Treat your wife with honor. Love her. Cherish her. You promised that in your wedding vows. Protect her. Give yourself for her. Even as Paul explains in Ephesians 5, even as Christ gave himself for the church. The church which is called his body. The church which is this vessel. This church which is like a cup containing the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us and who walks in us. My cup runneth over. The cup also reminds us of the Lord's table. I think truly at the Lord's table, my cup runneth over. The cleansing forgiveness of our sins is not limited. When we take the cup, we remember Christ and the infinite sacrifice of his blood that he made for our filthy and wicked and rebellious sin. Oh, it's not the elements, as we say each time we partake of the Lord's table. The elements are merely a reminder of what Jesus did on Calvary. And there he said, it is finished. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, not do this so that you can add to my work, not do this so that you can thus get sins forgiven. It's a remembrance of sins forgiven. But it is a picture in which the cup is used to show us at least three different things. Number one, it shows us our value to God, like that fine china. It shows us the prophetic future of Christ's return. And third, it shows our eternal fellowship with Christ. Did you know all of those things are taught by our Lord in the Last Supper and by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and following? Jesus said, likewise, also the cup after supper, he took saying, this cup, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. There's the value. 
Paul writes, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion? That word koinonia, which is translated communion there, is the word that means fellowship. Is it not the fellowship of the blood of Christ? You remember we saw that the eternal fellowship of Christ is symbolized by the cup. Paul says so. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion, the fellowship again, the koinonia of the body of Christ? Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. There are some people who are trying to hold two hands at once. God says, I'll have none of that. You either hold my hand or you hold the devil's hand, but you can't hold his hand in mine. Some people are trying. It doesn't work, folks. Verse 25, after the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now listen to verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, Here's the last phrase. Ye do show the Lord's death until he come. You're making a clear manifestation that Christ paid for sins once. And we are to do it till he comes. We do it looking forward to the promised return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see in the cup our value to God. We see our eternal fellowship with Christ. We see the prophetic future of Christ's return. Did you notice Paul called it the cup of blessing? We're supposed to use what is in our cup as a blessing for others. We're going to get to that in verse 6. Not today, but it's coming up in the 6th verse of the 23rd Psalm. Because the next phrase says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The cup filled with God's blessing that overflows with the Spirit of God moving through us is a cup that leaves in its wake. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, not precede me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I'll give you just one illustration of that. Whosoever shall give to drink one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Well, our time is up for today. There are just a few more things on that, but I think they're exciting things. We have a cup that never runs dry. And we are a cup that is to produce a blessing to those around us. A cup that carries something that is valuable. A cup in which resides the Spirit of God. A clean cup by the grace of God to bear the light of Christ to the world around us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the beauty of your word. O oh Lord, we were lost and undone. We were sinners when Christ came into the world to save us. We were not good. We were filthy. We were lost. We were broken. We were headed for hell. And yet our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great love, came to give us life. A life that would flow up and through and over the brim of our cup. A vessel that would carry something valuable. A temple in which the Spirit of God himself would live and walk and always be with us. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here who does not know Christ, oh, that, Father, you would irresistibly draw them to him, whom to know is life eternal, that they might drink the cup of salvation, 
And Father, for those of us who are saved, perhaps for too long we have ignored the fact that we're carrying something very valuable. We are chosen vessels who bear the name of Christ and we bear it before a watching world. Keep us from being unashamed of the testimony of Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number